say hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne St. Amand and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Allego. On behalf of everyone at Corporate Visions and Allego, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar and thank you for joining us. So let's get into today's theme. And I think today's theme couldn't be more on point given, that we're, given what we're all experiencing. The world has evolved instantly and forced us all into a 90 degree learning curve. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this and still come out on top? Well, we're gonna be talking about the idea of situational sales enablement and how this approach is critical for sales teams and other teams who must stay sharp despite zero opportunities for traditional training or in-person development. So I'm excited to introduce you to our experts. We'll be exploring this timely topic today. We're joined by Tim Reisterer, the Chief Strategy Officer at Corporate Visions. Tim's a visionary researcher, thought leader, and practitioner with more than 20 years of experience in marketing and sales management. He's also the co-author of four best-selling books on sales and marketing strategy. Joining Tim is Mark Magnaca, who's the president and co-founder of Allego. Mark is a serial entrepreneur and a two-time book author who has spent the last two decades helping sales leaders shorten the sales cycle and turn their best ideas into winning growth strategies. Okay, gentlemen, are you ready to kick us off and jump into this great topic? All right. Thanks, Thanks Wayne. Wayne. I'm yeah, ready. Fantastic. So, Mark, I, I jumped the gun with this visual before, but uh, it, when Wayne was talking about what everything did, I, I had this prepared, and it's kind of clever and cool, so I thought I'd play it again. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I think it's a great way to set up and a perfect, uh, in many ways, a great image that I think resonates with what all of us have experienced from somewhere between March 8th and March 15th, 2020, in terms of what happened to our world. Yeah, so I think today from our vantage points, um, so people understand where we're coming from is our world, we are, we are building messaging content and doing skills training to help enable salespeople, your world from the perspective of the technology to enable and make that all happen. We hope to take a holistic look at what has transpired and give you a sense as we work with hundreds of different companies, what they're all doing, what some of them aren't doing and, and what the difference is. So uh, we think we have a few uh, experiences, anecdotes, insights, and examples to share with you today. Well, Tim, I think on that note, there's uh, so much to jump into here. So I would really like to begin with this strategic context. So why don't we go ahead and jump right in with uh, you setting the stage for this topic and help people understand why this notion of just in time is what I'll call the coin of the realm as we move forward. <laughs> well, it's uh, whenever we talk about an idea, a concept, we always have to put it at some level in contrast. So I like to euphemistically say just in time versus maybe in the past we were just in case. And the idea of how just in time on this axis is, is moving us forward. But on the other axis, there's an opportunity here, I think, to increase the executive altitude as well as the business impact of your sales enablement program. So as you move up and to the right, like any good uh, diagram does, there's a, a potential sweet spot up here that I think intersects just in time with uh, this idea of executive impact, strategic initiative support. So in order to tell the story, I look at it as like three waves. So I'm, I'm old enough to remember reading Toffler's book, The Third Wave, I think in the 80s. And he talked about the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and the information age and revolution. We're now probably into Mach 6 of the information revolution. But I think sales enablement and training have, are uh, on their third wave. And, and to describe that, you kind of have to describe the first wave. So the first wave I, I, I like to refer to as the wave of catalogs where everything, you, you accumulated a bunch of training and enablement courseware, and then you put it into a curricula that you, you lined up to things like onboarding, 
competency maps, people's roles if they change the tenure, the time they're at the organization. And that now and again, then that, that flavor of the month global rollout where you spread it like peanut butter across the entire globe. So catalogs, curricula, and then the big one, calendar. Um, we would plot things on a calendar, rolling 12, 18 month plans. And you would teach these things when people could get on the calendar and you could get in front of them and then hope that it was good timing for them as well as the business. But often it was just driven by the calendar, the curricula and the catalogs that organizations had. And we're seeing that move up and to the right. So the first thing we're starting to see, many companies begin to adjust their enablement and their learning to is, is this next wave. And I, I like to refer to it as the KPI wave where people are now having greater access to uh, instead of things like what role are you in or how long have you been here or some abstract assessment or arbitrary competency map, there's tons of data out there about sales performance. So everybody's got their CRM, everybody's got their Salesforce installed and it's producing data that tells you exactly where salespeople are struggling and where they might be doing well. And the, the, the companies that are being that are moving to the right in the just in time world and and moving up in terms of the things that executives care about are saying, hey, this year, what do we got to do to make quota? And it literally has nothing to do with competency maps, role and tenure, or even just arbitrary global rollouts. It has everything to do with the KPIs that your salespeople are strong in or weak in. So what we're seeing is people looking at their dashboards and saying, hey, here's a cohort that is struggling, they don't have enough pipeline based on their close rates, they're gonna not make it this year. So we're not gonna give them negotiations training or we're not gonna give them this manager training or whatever their role or tenure or global rollout says, it's like that person becomes part of a cohort of others who are struggling with pipeline to learn specific skills, learn specific messages and techniques in order to create pipeline. But there's another group who has enough pipeline. There's another cohort and, and they struggle with I, what I like to call the constipated pipeline. They, they can't close the stuff. And then there's the cohort that has, I like to call the unscrupulous discounters. And then there's the people whose whole number will be made this year in that territory if they simply renew the bulk of their business. And then there's another group who are in a territory that have no new business, but really it's saturated and it's all upsell and cross sell. And the idea is we're working with companies who take these KPIs and are literally going to managers and saying, let's take a look at your teams and figure out which cohort they're in and the journey they're going to be on this year, which is more relevant to something measurable like the quota and, and using the KPI as the input. The best part of that is if you use the KPI as an input, guess what else you get to use? You get to judge the success of your program on the output does the number move? So no more smile sheets and you know, wondering did, did, did our investment pay off? You now know you went into this cohort because you sucked, you came out and did you get any better? Um, but that's not where it's fully vesting now in terms of like the just in time opportunity. And I'll just share this one more example and then we can chat about it. What we're now starting to see, sort of the ultimate in just in time and executive altitude is this idea of situational programming. You can't put these things on a calendar. You can't put these things in a curriculum. You can't put these things in a catalog because they happen. Um, we, we can't predict things, market changes like COVID. I kind of just covered that one up, Mark. Uh, we, can't, <laughs> we can't predict COVID, but it happens. And all of a sudden, everybody's gotta be ramped and they gotta be ramped in a matter of weeks, not months. When I think of the old um, learning path model here that, um, that uh, sorry, when I think of the old learning path model, this is, uh, this is uh, the technical era we are in now. When I think of the old learning path model, the issue is that it was 12 and 18 months rolling and now we're working in weeks. And we're seeing organizations that have to implement price increases and get thousands of people up to speed on that and be great at it and, and avoid churn or dissatisfaction. We see people with short windows of innovation opportunities who got to launch a product that might have been a, a 12 month roadshow in the past and they got to get thousands of salespeople certified and proficient on that story now so they can capitalize on the window. 
We're seeing market changes. Um, gee, Brexit happens, what's our story there? Uh, COVID happens, what's our story there? Business strategy shifts. We just acquired a piece of business. This just happened. And, and our competitor just made this sort of blitz or onslaught on us. And again, these things have to happen in weeks instead of the rolling months or even year forecast of planning and enablement that used to happen. And so we're calling these the just-in-time situational enablement. And what you also know is when these happen, all eyes, all the important eyes in the organization are on these things. And, and the needle is moving, the number is moving, and anybody who cares has got their eyes on it, so it has to happen. So I'm just going to pause there for a second um, because, in all honesty, um, this is what we're starting to see happen. And, and I know some people who love their calendar and their curriculum and catalogs are a little nervous about it and they're worried about chaos. Um, but yet, uh, arguably, in, in today's business world, um, this is an opportune moment. This is when your learners know they need to learn, they want to learn, so they will learn. So I talk about this idea of deficit learning. The bane of my existence as an enabler or a trainer has always been, are these people going to wanna to be here? Are they going to remember it? Well, as you move up and to the right, the people you're enabling are in a situation where they find themselves in a deficit. And being in a deficit is the number one impetus to learning. I've gotta learn this because my quota depends on it. I've gotta learn this because I've got to respond to this for our company against this competitor in this situation, in this market. So this concept of deficit learning is one that I think we all got to embrace that people will learn best when they're in a deficit. So let's meet them in that moment of deficit with the thing that fills it for them. Mark, thoughts on that? Tim, let's just ask our participants to pressure test the efficacy of what you just described in their own life. So ask yourself this question as relates to deficit learning. At what point are you interested in watching a short YouTube video, for example, on how to fix a flat tire on your car? Choice A is six months before you ever get a flat tire so that you could be prepared for it, or when you're on the side of the road and you realize, I've never done this before. So if you think about how much YouTube has informed our entire culture now as it relates to this notion of just-in-time learning and how valuable the notion of giving people what they need to know, when they need to know it, and aligning with the way human beings actually work and what motivates us and what incents us rather than trying to force feed us, which has been a model from the past, you know, Tim, as you were going through this, I, I couldn't help but think of um, that famous line from Charles Dickens, where the, the, the story opens. Um, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And, you know, what's interesting about the, the poetry of that is that I have a friend and the wife is a teacher and the husband is in the software business. And they literally said as a couple, it's been the best of times for him in a crazy way since COVID happened. He's had more freedom. He's loved the work that he's doing from home. He's had more time with his family. His wife was a middle school teacher. She said, it has been the worst of times for so many reasons. But why do I tell you this? I'm telling you this because if you go back to the learning path, so much of the L&D framework, the mental model that exists in our culture for how people should learn at work is based upon academia on how people learned at school, in particular universities. And the real issue is the university model is literally about 500 years old. Things that have been organized, like it takes 12 years to get basic education or to get a, a PhD. They had this, this luxury, it seems, of time that things could take a very long time. And really what I think you're doing, and which is why we're so excited about the work we're doing together across different industries with shared clients that we have is you're simply bringing to form a very intuitive concept, which is look, situational programs like the ones you just described are the future, I think, in a post COVID. And I want to be clear for those of you who have a strong LD background, that's not to say that there's not a need for some level of foundational learning. We accept that and we acknowledge that there are certain foundational things like. You need to learn addition before you learn multiplication. I get that. But if you think about the way you have to interact with a sales organization, 
this orientation is the, the difference between the reason why people want to participate in, in corporate visions programs versus they resist so much training. And Tim, I do just want to tell people, we first met several years ago where one of our shared asset management clients literally said, almost like peanut butter and chocolate, they said to me, Mark, you've got to meet these guys because what they're doing is totally revolutionary. And here we are. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I think that uh, I, um, I, I read some really good tweets and, and, and articles recently in preparing for this. And somebody said that the fast changing world we're in right now, everybody in business has to think like there's a shark hunting them. And the reason you want to think like there's a shark hunting you is this uh, idea that everything has to pick up pace. And the new premium for companies is speed. It's, it's, in fact, valuations are being done based on companies' ability to uh, run at pace or at speed. So this, this is the foundational business principle right now. And uh, the question then becomes, is sales enablement um, ready for it, I guess? And, uh, and, and, and all the ideas I've just shared uh, come down to a, to a couple things, that there's uh, something that the company needs to do about the story and the message that for each of those scenarios. But then there's obviously necessary, necessary content for the sales team or for the customer facing uh, piece of this, but also the skills piece. This is what's interesting is sometimes in the past, I've seen that um, like maybe marketing's working on messaging and then enablement's packaging it into content. And then L and D is teaching skills and these things do not come together. And the reality is situational sales enablement is the sum of those things. The message, just the right message for that moment, the right content asset based on how that interaction is going to go down. Is it emailing? Is it, is it virtual presentations? Is it um, what kind of blurb or what kind of instrument or tool or modality do you need? And then just those specific skills components to execute that story with that content. So instead of it being, I'm going to give you 10 competencies over the course of two days, I'm going to give you three micro learning lessons on how to set a high offer and um, uh, negotiate under pressure and to concede according to a plan, video, 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 video. And here's your email and your presentation. Oh, and here's your message. And you're going to do a price increase uh, conversation. Now, the other thing that makes us all come together and what you were alluding to, Mark, that I think is really important is there's this idea that um, you can quiz out of enablement. Like I learned this and now I take a quiz. And the idea of practice and some level of coaching and some level of proficiency is, is, um, is left to chance. And what I would say is that the situational enablement program around price increasing, price increases doesn't scale to thousands of people and we don't know those thousands of people are able to do this without the tech to do it. And so to your point, yeah, we like to think we do this really well, um, but the reason we're talking together is executing situational programs at pace on scale um, requires the, the technology to do it as well. So exciting times. Um, and those, those things that the visionary companies were telling us needed to happen together four years ago um, are now no longer visionary. They are best practice, I guess you could argue. They are, and Tim, before you go off that slide, um, I will tell you, I couldn't help but think as you were talking about it, that for anyone who's ever played a game like golf, the idea that all you need to do is practice it in a laboratory or talk about it with a, in a laboratory before you ever actually hit a ball. And then you realize there's this variance between what you think you're supposed to do and then your body actually doing it. That, that dynamic, I think, is very much relevant here. And the reason that so many golfers have recognized that they need to see themselves on video to be able to diagnose what is it that they're doing? Because sometimes from the perspective of yourself, you just can't tell. So I think that this notion of, of um, recognizing the value of a, of a swing coach, if you will, but also recognizing that you need some technology to go along with your knowledge of how to play the game um, kind of brings this whole thing together. Before we go on, we do have one great question that, uh, that came up 
from uh, one of our guests, Carl, who said, um, didn't we have a similar situation after December 7th, 1941, as it relates to situational enablement? To which I would say, Carl, absolutely. And the, and the interesting thing that you should know is that um, the only difference, it, there was many differences, but the biggest difference from my perspective as a student of World War II is that in the United States of America, absolutely, December 8th, the world had changed in this country. The difference in COVID is we'd never really have had a time since 1918 where the entire world has basically shut down. So, so what we've just go out, gone through and to some extent are still very much going through uh, is even at a broader scale. But I want to just uh, dotted line back to your question because the word enablement has also been used as a synonym for the word readiness. And the word readiness absolutely has a military connotation, which is, is our military ready? And you want to know the simple truth we learned on December 8th, 1941? Is our military was not ready. And that's why the invasion of Normandy did not happen on D-Day until 1944, because it took us a couple years to get ready. And I think the takeaway from that example is now more than ever, this speed that Tim's been talking about, this capacity to execute quickly, that in and of itself is a differentiator. Yeah, I'm, I, I wish I was a, a, a student, a student, student as you are of history. And uh, and I'm a horrible golfer, so I appreciate both of those analogies. But I, here's what I here's what I captured. What you just said that's interesting is I feel like this space we're in, we used to call sales readiness, and now we call it sales enablement. Ironically, and and um, and and I think when uh, when you talk about situational programs, are all about getting you ready, and again at speed again, and the level of practice, coaching, and proficiency is about like being fit for duty, knowing that this person is certified, knowing that this person is capable, proficient at a level that you need it. And, and, and I feel like, you know, in some ways we thought we were going to a better place when we moved to sales enablement, a more strategic land where we do bigger things. But in some ways we lost that sense of urgency. Like we semantically softened what it is the goal enablement versus readiness. Um, and I think, such, you know, I don't know. I don't know if we can bring it back, but sales readiness might be a better term actually for the world of situational programming. Well, the great thing about adding situational just as a, so we all have a common language as we jump forward here to this next piece, this, this next situation really that you're going to describe is that um, the notion of situational enablement to me gives it a little bit of juice in terms of like, we're addressing this situation now. And I think for those sales leaders who are on this webinar with us and, and really for anyone in sales management, the way that most people in sales leadership orient their thinking is based on specific goals, specific projects, um, specific strategic, to, uh, strategic initiatives. And so to that, to that end, the idea of aligning a way to get ready to solve a specific problem, like some of the examples you're about to get into, I think again, there's just a natural alignment and that's why I believe people have responded so well. This isn't just a case, Tim, in my observation of our joint clients, of people who are desperate. And so they'll just grab any, you know, any rope while they're falling. This is people who are recognizing, you know what? I, I've actually tried lots of different things over time. And even since March, I've tried different things. And I've now recognized that some of the things and some of the ways we were doing it actually don't make sense in a post-COVID world even if there was a vaccine tomorrow, there's things that we're not going to go back and do the same way. Yeah, everybody will have figured out, I think, how to just pick up the pace a little bit. So um, that uh, it, it isn't about, oh, can, when can we go back in the classroom, right? For example, and do a, an 18 month rollout. Um, funny story in February, this is just this last February, I was speaking with a client. And they were having a hard time securing classrooms, enough classrooms for as many people as they needed to train across the globe. And they literally came to us and said, could you maybe start a service line where you actually identify classrooms and meeting rooms around the globe and help your clients uh, fill those because we can't do that. It's not a competency. And that was just February and March. That was not not only a bad business idea, that wasn't like even a conversation. It, there's the, and, and I there don't know- There was plenty of availability in March though. Right, we right. I could, I, right. Our business model might've uh, at least found the capacity, but the, the idea there that 
nobody's going to want to start writing checks anytime soon for the costs um, of travel uh, uh, in sales, in sales training, in any of those things. I just, I just hear it from all the companies we're talking to. So the idea now that um, it doesn't require finding a room, securing that room, and then you as a learner have to wait till your number is called six months later. And by that time, the, the emergency has passed, the urgency has passed, and I missed my window of opportunity, right? I'm now six months after I needed to create pipeline. Or in this case, I've got three that I want to walk through. These are three specific situations that we worked with clients to build a message, content, and micro skills learning in a package in a matter of weeks and then deployed. And then they would get online, not only experience the content, but then submit themselves in a level of practice and demonstrated proficiency again in weeks. And these things happen that fast. Remember, the shark is hunting you. So one of them I'll talk about is a competitive threat where unexpectedly senior level executives from our client's competitor started literally parachuting into um, our client's customers at the highest levels, C-level to C-level. And our client wasn't ready to respond to that because their relationships were not at the C-level. Um, the second one I'll talk about is this idea of um, a price increase. It was, it was worth 7% of the growth that was projected for the coming year would be a successful price increase. And you can't miss your 7% target. How do you get thousands of people up to speed and proficient on a price increase that doesn't um, uh, churn your customer or like destroy your NPS scores? And then another one that I'll talk about real briefly is a company that we know had a 90 day, they believe they had a 90 day window, a competitive edge that before their num their arch rival could start copying it. Um, and so they wanted to launch and, and close deals and take share in that 90 days because at some point they, they, the competitor could even that out. Well, you couldn't do the traditional roadshow by any stretch. And again, they had thousands of sellers to get ready and certify fit for duty on that new product message. So these are a couple examples. I'll, I'll quickly sort of take us through them. Um, so the competitive move, which you need to think about here is imagine, I need you to imagine that uh, you're in an organization and all of a sudden your arch rival starts bringing their top guns into the C-suite. And because of their brand, they can get a meeting with the C-suite at your customers and your sellers are primarily linked to the decision maker a number of levels below. Think of like head of IT or head of supply chain or head of, you know, name the business unit. These guys are coming in at a C level with a very sweet deal, including some very strong pricing incentives. And now you have to respond. You need to have a story and you need to gain altitude in a hurry. So we built some messaging that was designed for the executive level. The idea of how do you retain this business and um, actually, now that we have access to the C-level, begin to grow the business. The problem is that you get delegated to who you sound like. And unfortunately, to this date, our client was very satisfied with their share of the wallet and the experience and the relationship at the level they were at. So we have a framework, though, that uh, is designed for the C-suite. So we brought that into action and built a message, built some essential talk tracks, and, and, and messages to gain access and get that appointment, built a quick presentation uh, to uh, leverage at that appointment, and then ultimately provided some micro training videos in the package about how to have that executive conversation. This is the challenge, right? Message, content, oh, and the skills, because this is a different conversation. They needed some confidence. Well, that included some role play rehearsal um, and some uh, quick virtual training sessions and this all got out there because it needed to in two weeks from, holy cow, we need to respond to here, everybody, here's a message, here's some content assets, and here's a couple micro learning modules. Let's start role playing this thing. And we had, in that case, the first 300, then eventually the next uh, thousand done in a matter of weeks and ready to respond. This just didn't happen in the past, right? So they're logging in, they're getting this stuff, they're doing virtual role plays, submitting themselves doing their gaining access message, a very potent and powerful program designed to respond to something that happened in the moment just in time and when the sellers found themselves in a deficiency. 
Um, the second one was wait, the pricing. Wait, go on. Yeah, Just yeah, absolutely, Mark. I want to connect the dot here because I think this is a critical differentiator that um, not everyone can say. And I can vouch for this because I, I watched it with a shared client. I can tell you that in the asset management arena, um, this is obviously pre-COVID. So it was 2016, specifically June 23rd, 2016. And at that point, when the Brexit vote happened in, you know, it's obviously not done yet, but it happened on June 23rd, 2016. The, the people in financial services fell into two categories. The vast majority had no idea how to respond with a message and a very small subset of them did know how to respond. And I know firsthand in terms of the work that you did to get people ready, this was brilliant. Um, you had an A message and a B message. So people had been able to practice how they're going to respond if it had passed or if it had not passed. The joint customer that we worked with hit the ground running the Monday after the Friday that Brexit passed. And it absolutely transformed them in the marketplace because their team was able to go to market with a message that they had an answer and their people had confidence. Most of their competitors, it took as long as a month before their marketing department was able to adapt with an answer. So as you think about this in terms of context, I wanna be clear, there's Johnny Come Lately's who are right now jumping on the, we know how to do virtual bandwagon. And there's companies that have actually embedded this in their DNA going back several years. Yeah, and, and I remember talking about the idea that, uh, of situational enablement back in the day and, and I did, I would get pushback from learning and development department, department saying that is chaos. We can't manage chaos and things. And so it is interesting to see some of these things come to fruition. And I appreciate that the story from back when as well. Um, and and th that was a, a great example and a powerful moment. Um, and, and I think the thing about the content and the message, the content and the skills, and then being able to launch this at speed and, and have people certify, that's important to understand is that Again, it's, it's three groups that used to do their own thing that now have to find a way to coalesce quickly into a thing. And, and I believe that, that enablement sits in that pocket, that sweet spot, because you know, marketing's doing this and maybe content here and L&D there. Somebody's got to be the keeper of this flame and, uh, and fan it into a bigger fire. And I think the strategy of intersecting those things is, is you, the enabler. Uh, the price increase one, like I said, is interesting. We need 7% of our growth this year is going to be from communicating a price increase. Oh, by the way, we don't want to churn too much of the business, right? And so again, having a messaging framework, and this is the thing we specialize in, is science-backed frameworks for these different moments of truth. Building a price increase message that's based on a framework that works. Building some content, we called it the Why Pay More Call Guide to structure the conversation. We gave them emails, voicemails, and some talk tracks. Um, we, pr we predicted questions, objections, and responses. They actually then got some micro training videos because, you know what? Yeah, I remember taking tr negotiations training when I onboarded 10 years ago, right? That's not going to help me now. So we bring some of the most important concepts of negotiations related to price increases, particularly in just one minute knowledge refreshers to get people back up to speed. And again, we talk, we're talking about something that happened in four weeks because this had to roll at the beginning of the year. And you had to have, in this case, 6,000 sellers ready to execute a successful price increase at the beginning of the year. And that's just something that, again, might've been an email that was drafted before, and then you throw it over the transom and you say, here's the, here's the price increase story. And then you, you hope everybody does it well, but they don't suck at it. And uh, if there's anything we're seeing in the situational enablement world, it's that it's message content and skills. And again, a demonstrated level of, of proficiency, fluency, or fit for duty. I got one more, Mark. Did you have any comments on this one or should I? I, I think that that's the big piece. When I mean, you think about message content and skills, anybody on this call who's had anybody report to them understands the dynamic of going into a sales meeting or a prospect meeting and you're a sales manager as an example and either biting your tongue or cringing when the salesperson is either um, unintentionally misrepresenting something or just has their facts wrong but it's sometimes very hard to jump in at that moment to correct them so the, the notion of being able to practice and even in this example of the price increase Despite all of your best efforts, recognizing that 
there are things that are unknowable until you go pressure test it in the real world. So having that feedback loop to continue to get best ideas from people within the organization and have that information be disseminated quickly so everybody can learn instead of the same mistake having to be made 6,000 times. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It, it, Tim, uh, we, we've had a question. Uh, yeah, Tim, sure, Wayne. We've had a question come in, um, actually specific to you. Uh, this person is looking for elaboration on why you think that just-in-time trainings are not as appropriate for traditional learning libraries. And obviously you can both contribute on that one. Well, I'm not sure I said that. Um, I, if, you, if you really were to push me on this, um, I believe that all learning should be situational. I believe that um, sort of arbitrary competency maps and the assessments that, were, were, that uh, went with them are, are questionable in terms of do they really produce the results um, and uh, even onboarding, this is what you're going to be onboarded on. Well, if I show up being a pretty good negotiator, but I don't know how to create pipeline, I shouldn't onboard on negotiations. I should onboard on the thing where I might have some challenges. So I think assessment should be more related to the KPIs and look historically at things like that and, and, and focus on, we have behavioral outcomes based research to compared to high performers, high adopter, high performers in each of those KPIs. And we can tell you which of these things they should start with. So the reality I think is, um, I believe all learning should be deficit-based and situational. It even gives you a good case for why this is what you're taking, not because the corporation thought everybody should do this, but because this is designed to help you where you need help. And, um, and again, so KPIs or key initiatives, it, I'm hard pressed to think that calendars and catalogs and curricula are going to exist at all in the way that they ever did. And I think there's different ways to identify deficiencies and be situational about enablement uh, and stop the spread of peanut butter across the entire globe. Hey, Wayne, I, like, I, I like peanut butter. I'm not anti-peanut butter. I just want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be clear about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think I may have been the one Tim, that made the statement that about, you know, this is not me, we're opposed to foundational learning, and we're not. But I'm just going to use an example that may help address this question that came in. Um, I want you to think about a traditional learning library for a sales organization. I'm going to use pharmaceuticals as an example. And the curriculum was based on things like how to enter the doctor's office, the interaction with the staff, the different elements that you need to work on as a pharma rep as it relates to securing appointments, meeting with doctors, having them sign certain forms. So let's just assume you've, you completed that curriculum in February of 2020. The simple reality is all the work, all the time, all the energy, it became moot effective around March 15th. So what we're saying here is, while there is absolutely a need in most companies to have some level of foundational learning, and we're not saying they're mutually exclusive because there are certain things that can be foundational, let's call it 90% is more than likely more of this just-in-time basis, and 10% is uh, the sort of traditional foundational learning versus the reciprocal. Too many companies in the past were 90% locked and loaded. As Tim said, there was such a, a, such a desire to say, we've got everything planned out for 36 months. Well, what we now know is in the C-suite across uh, the world, really, not just North America, very few people are, are doing five-year plans today. Um, McKinsey and all the big consulting firms are recognizing that if you can get people to do 12 months, 18 months, um, that's a long time in the future. Why would our planning of how, what people need to learn want to go out farther than that? It's great. Gentlemen, just want to give you a quick time check. It's about 2.42. We probably want to go for about another eight minutes and leave about 10 open for questions, roughly. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'll start to jump in. I just wanted to hear that that last this product launch one's good, and then we'll we'll get to any other questions. Yeah. So uh, I, I, this is a great example. I mean, I have been part of a lot of roadshows. Just to be honest, uh, city to city, sales team to sales team, roll out a new product, and and they can take six, twelve months or longer. Um, and but you, in this case, I mentioned they had a ninety day window. I don't know. I'll be honest, I don't know exactly how they timed that and said our competitor could probably copy it, but they probably knew what it took for them to build it and maybe they, they, did, a, they did a number with that. But this was a very large company, 
10,000 sellers that had to move before the competition did with something they thought was a game changer uh, for the moment they had it. And so that was a scenario where we had to, again, say, okay, and you're going to see a pattern here. So that's, that's good, I think. Situational enablement is a pattern of message, content, skills, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, fluency uh, and demonstrated proficiency. But it was a, a very disruptive and differentiated product. It's not a price increase. That's a different kind of message and conversation. It's not a, um, it's not a executive level protect and grow message. That's an expansion type message. This was a very disruptive, we're gonna go take some share for like 90 days. We're gonna beat the snot out of our competition because they aren't gonna be able to touch this. And it's a whole different kind of conversation. This is the other thing about being situational and why it's so important to include skills in this. So you package it up in the right kind of content because this is now content that needs to be used to gain access to competitive accounts. So teaser videos, uh, sales presentation deck, call kite to try and generate demand. So situationally, you know what message it is because you know the situation you're entering, taking competitive share, um, meeting with our existing L uh, executives, talking to our procurement customers about the price increase. So the message has to be on, but the content asset has to be situational as well. What do they need to accomplish? What modalities and channels are they using? And then the same with the training. In this case, the, the skill to have a highly disruptive, break the status quo bias conversation with a competitive customer is different than the skill to negotiate a 7% increase or reach executive altitude. And so they needed the specific training components for having that disruptive conversation because they needed to kind of understand why this story was so different, why their solution was different and how they could leverage the, that story and all the tools they were given. And then when they got in front of the customer, the key again, they had to be able to show, and this was a very important one. They wanted people to certify on this new disruptive story, um, not just say they read it, completed it. I always joke again, you can't quiz out of a great sales conversation. You actually have to perform the great sales conversation. But here we are. I mean, it took six weeks it, 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 and, and uh, we timed it so that when the launch went to the market, the salespeople were ready and it was like go time for 90 days. We're still calculating the impact and the share that they took on it. But again, just to think of that in contrast to where, um, where you've been in the past in terms of getting sales ready to, uh, to execute a product launch at speed. So you know, Tim, uh, I have to, yeah. as, as people are digesting that, um, here's the reality as I'm listening to what you're saying, I don't know how a sales leader just based on the law of physics could imagine getting 10,000 people ready in 90 days, even if you have very large classes of a couple hundred people at a time, just, uh, just the technical element of flying to different parts of the globe, trying to get things translated, just, I mean, it's almost not even possible. So being able to help get people out of the mindset, which is I think a big part of what um, Corporate Visions has done is help people think differently about how else could we do this? And recognizing in, in some of the same ways, you can have the best restaurant food on the planet, but if people can't go into your restaurant, you need a mechanism to get the food to the people. So enter all of these delivery services who figured out how to enable getting the food to the people. And I feel like that's kind of the, the, the combination. And oh, look at this. Um, yeah, I got cool videos that-, that You do, <laughs> look at <Yeah>. this. <laughs> there it is. That's the one uh, Elon threw the, uh, the rock he threw the brick at the window, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so don't wreck my moment here. <laughs> but the uh, the idea here is that you're either being disrupted or you're going to be the disruptor. And I don't think I even like this truck, and I don't know if he'll sell a single one. But he's still doing a pretty good business in the market, isn't he? <laughs> well, you know, given the fact that the market is valuing Tesla not just more than General Motors, but at 10x the value of the combined General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford, there's, there's something to be said by having a fundamental different way of looking at the world. And whether you agree with that company or not, uh, that's a big part of what we're talking about here. So speaking of fundamentally different ways of looking at the world, and I know Wayne's going to tell us his time in a second, but I've, I've, I've now featured you. So Wayne, you don't ah. have to. Uh, um, the, 
the sort of breakthrough moment here, I got to be honest, and this is where companies got to gut check themselves on situational programs, is what is your culture ready to do? What does your culture need to do when it comes to this idea of practice, coaching, and a level of demonstrated, in some cases, certified proficiency on things? One of our uh, favorite clients calls it being fit for duty, that they want to see that every single person is fit for duty on that price increase or fit for duty on that new product launch message or fit for duty on having that executive higher level conversation that too much training, learning, development and enablement has uh, sort of been conducted in a way that it's been pushed out there and maybe, just maybe, somebody took a second to stand and deliver, but there's been no deep practice, no deep coaching, and no expectation of a demonstrated level of proficiency. And to me, the situational programs we're talking about, and I think make it actually the success it is, is or, and now you can do it at scale, that's the point, is um, you have to have people demonstrate, like record themselves doing this thing, and um, and then instead of, when they're in the room, oftentimes they're just glad it's over. Like they just want a beer. Um, but they, 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 they get detailed coaching and feedback and scoring against the rubric. Their managers get to see that and coach them. And, and a, a level of certification or fit for duty, uh, my mind can't comprehend how moving forward companies can't have this as part of the rhythm. But again, it couldn't really happen in a room because you didn't have enough time, the day was gonna end, and so you put four people on a team, so you only did a partial assignment, right. and then you barely practiced. But I, I'll tell you this, when they record themselves, you guys probably have stats, our stats are, they practice 6.8 times before they hit the submit button. So that's probably about 6.3 times more than they usually do in a classroom. But anyways, I digress. The idea here is that um, complete assignment, I have to do the whole assignment. I'm not part of a team where I can sort of hide in the back um, I practice more and I get detailed coaching and feedback versus the instructor saying, yeah, good job, boy. everybody give them a round of applause and um, a level of certification that says, I can do this thing. And I think this is the one thing that enablement re uh, people need to think about and why I think the readiness word is kind of interesting is this is the world I think we're moving into and it can be done at scale um, without having to travel the globe to accomplish it. And it can be done better than when we were face to face. So Tim, I got to pick up on that before we get to questions here. Um, I, I was fortunate to be part of a round table with um, senior executives across telecommunications, uh, financial services, med device, pharmaceutical, banking, uh, a number of different uh, verticals. And one of the executives told a story about his uh, recent national sales meeting. And the essence of it was this. Um, it's not a huge sales force. There's about 250 uh, direct sellers and um, the, the entire sales organization is about 500 people with the inside and outside group. And he said in 2019, the cost of flying all of those people into the headquarters city was $800,000. It was a, basically a three-day event, airfare, hotel, meals, the whole, the whole nine yards, about 800 grand. So this year they did it. They implemented a whole bunch of things in the spirit of what you're talking about with this fluency challenge. They first of all cut everything to four hours a day instead of eight. The meetings always ran late and anyone on this call I'm sure has been at the meetings, it's supposed to end at four and it's still going on at five o'clock and people are totally spent, right? So they cut it to four hours. Everybody got a gift and everybody got a meal. So literally a pizza was delivered to every one of these people. The net of it was, in addition to a bunch of other innovations they came up with, when, when it was all over, he said, this cost just under 200,000 bucks. So one of the other executives said to him, if we had a vaccine tomorrow, would you go back to doing it in person? He paused for a moment and he said, you know what? I couldn't look my CFO in the eye with a straight face and tell him that we got $600,000 worth of value on what we did last year versus what we did this year. And in fact, when we did the survey, because they had gotten all the survey back, that with the exception of people saying they missed seeing their friends, which I get, um, it was literally one of the best meetings they've ever had. So I think what you've done is helped inject into the collective conscious here that there is a way to do this. And it doesn't mean we never get together in the future for, for what I'm gonna call the social element, 
But if we're going to get together for the social element, maybe that's what we get together for. It's for that reason with a little bit of training rather than eight hours a day in a hotel in Hawaii somewhere where, why did we fly here anyway? Yep. I'm, I'm with you. I, and, and just to that point, we had a client of ours bring in some data scientists and we did a controlled study, uh, no training, classroom training, and virtual training in this model on a specific um, um, competency. And we were able to show that pipeline that in fact, the virtual model produced more pipeline 90 days, a pipeline increase, I should say, than live. In terms of average contract value ACV, the virtual delivered uh, an equivalent level of increase in ACV. In terms of the confidence level, you talk about the confidence and the satisfaction of the participants. The confidence level was up by 2x and the satisfaction level was up 4x for the virtual versus the live. So at some level, this is preferred by people. They're gaining more confidence because I think they practice more, to be honest. Their ACV and pipeline are the same or better. Uh, why, again, when 50% when, when of the cost of any training is all those expenses you mentioned, why would we ever do that again? And I would say when other companies are expecting that their people are going to demonstrate proficiency, why would you not? Um, so, Wayne, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and we're going to answer some questions and I'm going to pull up a free ebook that, uh, that we're going to offer here uh, for folks. But uh, Mark and I are ready to answer any questions. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mark. Great content. Couldn't be more relevant for the times. Uh, I, I will say, unfortunately, we have more questions than we have time, but let's get to as many as we possibly can. Um, okay. Here's one you could both, uh, you could both take, but you decide. Um, is there better retention with professionally created or homemade micro learning videos? The first can take a long time to create and is more costly. The latter is an expensive, but might not be perfect. So what are your thoughts? Better retention with professionally created or homemade micro learning videos? So Mark, I'm going I'm to let you start with that. Uh, are you going to give it to me? I'm going to give it yeah, to you because here's, I mean, we professionally develop stuff for our clients. So I have a bias. You are a platform and you've seen all of it come on there, professionally developed, homegrown, and I'm guessing it's a combo, but you do it because you've seen more of this. So what I would say is, Tim, there's always a, um, there's always a framework for what I'm going to call what does good look like. So if you're in the context of the messaging, having a subject matter expert in what I'll call a polished video certainly helps. But I think the spirit of the question can be best answered in this way. When you go on YouTube, do you check whether the person that you're dealing with has a PhD from an Ivy League university? Or do you watch the video and say, they're showing me how to cut a pineapple. They're showing me how to fix a flat tire. It's the same car I have. I can see that they can demonstrate proficiency because they're doing it. And so long as the, the audio sound, which I think is one of the important things people miss, so long as the audio is clear, even in the case where the visual is not great, it still works. So at, at Allegra, we say YouTube, not Hollywood. And the reason for that is the trade-off of having, I mean, people don't realize, but this, this is the equivalent of a television studio as recently as the 1980s. The, the quality of this camera, the capability of what you can do in your home office with your camera with the right lighting is literally like broadcast television not that long ago. So that said, we believe in YouTube, not Hollywood. There's a couple of basic rules of um, how to make those videos compelling. But ultimately, 80 to, I mean, ask yourself this question. If you had a choice between seeing a top performer at your company demonstrate proficiency that you could see today, or, and it may be a little grainy or the lighting's not perfect, but you understand the message, or in 30 days, you're going to get a Hollywood version of it, but you're basically on your own for the next 30 days. My suspicion is, again, going back to human nature, most people would say, give me the one now, let me get started, because it needs to be 80% good enough to get me going. That, that would be how uh, I would address that. So what we typically do is we have some of this micro learning on the shelf already for these, cap these skills, right? These are skills we teach all the time. So we put those into the sales enablement kit. And then as good, really good fluency challenges show up, we put the good ones in front of, hey, here's your peers and here's the ones that have been deemed good. So we have kind of a blend of the stuff that shows the science of how to have that conversation. And here's some of your peers having that conversation. Here's why I also think that's better. When you sit in a classroom with 20 other people getting up, not all of them are good. So you get to watch a lot of bad. 
And that's not good. You might get some bad habits. So we, you know, sharing the best examples is powerful and showing your peers doing it, I agree. And Tim, I'd add one other thing that people often miss, particularly people in training. Um, and bear in mind, I come from a training background, so I have a, a special affection for people in this arena. Um, what I can tell you is that what we've said to so many enablement people is, look, the right mental model here is you are the director of the movie. You're not the actor. And Francis Ford Coppola was not in The Godfather. He was pulling the cast of The Godfather together and orchestrating it. That's what we believe the best sales enablement people are doing in the future. And if, if you stay with that metaphor, that the mix of some of the professionally produced content that Tim is talking about balanced with the most credible people. So the rub is sometimes marketing or training are not the right people to feature in the video. What most people care about is I want the most credible person who, who not only demonstrates proficiency, but I know is respected because they have proven based on their quota, they can do this. That to me is, is one of the critical distinctions that we've learned. Okay, gents, time for literally one more if you go quick. <laughs> uh, did you find that, or rather, do you find that responding situationally based on KPIs results in being more reactive rather than proactive in addressing training and coaching needs? So I'm the one who brought up KPIs. And here's what I would say is it's way more proactive than uh, competency maps and um, um, traditional uh, learning paths because it's showing you in either recent history or in real time where they're struggling. And, and I would say that, let that that's real data showing what's really happening in their world and as a result, your world as a company. So that's why it's the second rung. The third rung is, hey, let's be really proactive and respond to these initiatives or take first mover advantage on these initiatives. But in the middle, there are KPIs and we now have that data. Why wouldn't we use it and give people stuff to make them better at the thing they appear to be lagging in? Uh, as opposed to giving them something that they think they need, that they want to take. You know, when you ask people, what training do you need? They don't usually pick the thing they need. They pick the thing they like. And the thing they like, they're usually good at. So you're giving them more training on the thing they're good at because uh, they don't want to do the thing they're not good at. So this is why KPIs are the great equalizer. And I, I recommend them as a step up from some of the arbitrary competency models and maps and tests and assessments that I've seen. Wayne, I'd like to leave with a quote. Uh, Tim answered that question. I have nothing to add. The quote is from Maya Angelou, the great American poet. And she said this, she said, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. And I think that concept can apply to everyone listening right now. We did the best we could with what we had pre-COVID. We're in a totally different world now. We can do better. That's what we're here to do. Fantastic. Great sentiment to end on, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tim. Really relevant, great content and great conversation. Thank you so much. So everyone, on behalf of Tim and Mark and everyone at Alego and everybody at Corporate Visions, thank you again so very much for joining us uh, for today's webinar. We will be sending a recording of the presentation your way tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. Again, we appreciate your time and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.